manager for wildlife management projects. She received her tertiary education from the Postgraduate Institute of Science, Sri Lanka, and the National University of Singapore. She has also been trained in endangered species management by the Darrell Wildlife Conservation Trust, United Kingdom. Besides her volunteer experience at the Singapore Zoo in the reptile section, she has also worked with many environment-based community projects through the UNDP GES Small Grants Program in Sri Lanka. Her research interests include endangered species recovery, wildlife trade, urban ecology, wildlife policy, and community engagement. Her talk today will be useful for anyone who is interested in saving endangered species, reptiles, or those wanting to follow their passion in wildlife as a career. In this talk, wildlife biologist Danushi will be sharing her recent internship experience with the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation working with two endemic and threatened reptiles in the beautiful island of Mauritius. Protecting endemic flora and fauna from invasive species is one of the biggest challenges faced by species recovery projects. Mauritius is no exception, where many introduced species have turned invasive and only about 1.3% of non-degraded forests remain. So warm welcome, Danushree, and over to you now. Okay, uh, thank you, Sharmista. Let me just set up the uh, slide. Okay. Um, you can see the screen? Yes, we can see. Okay, great. Uh, hang on. Okay, so uh, thanks, Sharmista, for the introduction, uh, and also thanks to everyone who are here joining on a Sunday. Um, I'm really happy to have this opportunity to share a bit about the work experience that I had. Uh, so in addition to what uh, Sharmista just told about by my background, uh, I also made a career switch about four years ago from the oil and gas industry. So uh, in the last four years, I had to get my qualifications uh, right, uh, up to speed and all that. So because I lacked uh, field experience, uh, I applied to this uh, uh, position as an intern uh, with the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation. So that's the experience that I will be talking about today. So I was part of this uh, Islands Restoration Program, which is a collaboration between the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation and the Darrell Wildlife Conservation Trust. So that was to rewild uh, islands and also to boost the endemic reptile populations in Mauritius. Uh, actually, when I was making the presentation, I realized that there's an interesting link uh, between uh, the Wildlife Foundation in Mauritius with India, which I will be sharing a bit later. So, yeah, that's an introduction to what I do. Uh, so, uh, Mauritius, uh, I'm sure some of you have heard or, or maybe visited uh, this country. Uh, it's, an, it's a volcanic island uh, in the Mascarines. Uh, and then the Mascarene Islands are made up of these three islands, which are the mainland of Mauritius, uh, Reunion, and Rodrigues. Uh, it's also classified as a biodiversity hotspot in the region um, because it's under a lot of threat. Um, there's only less than 1.5% of uh, native forest remaining there and 39% of plants, 80% of uh, non-marine birds, 80% reptiles, and 40% of uh, bat species are endemic there. Uh, so it's uh, also a very high level of endemism. And 89% uh, of their flora, are, their endemic flora are threatened. So uh, the Mascarene Islands together, they contain some of the number of species fascinating for, for a small landmass like uh, the mascarines. Okay, so the main threats uh, to the biodiversity here is from things like invasive species, uh, deforestation, uh, because a lot of forests are being cleared for timber and agriculture. So I'll talk about that a bit later. 
So, Dodo is um, also something that uh, a lot of people have heard in conservation circles. Uh, about 61 uh, plant species of Mauritius, uh, indigenous plant species, are already extinct, and 24 of their native species of Mauritius have also gone extinct. So, one of the most famous ones is Dodo. So, the Dodo belongs distantly to the family of pigeons. And uh, the thing is, uh, Mauritius also has a history of uh, colonial times. So I think from uh, the 1500s when the Portuguese came to 1600s when the Dutch came and then came the French, then came the British. So there came a lot of uh, humans. And then with humans came a lot of invasive species. For example, cats, dogs, rats, goats, you know, cows, the whole, uh, all of the domesticated animals and prints, uh, things like even mongooses, tenrex, uh, monkeys. So all these are uh, big predators which were not previously on this island. And a lot of these species had never seen such predators before and they have not been adapted uh, to escape from them. So they were really easy prey uh, and then they were wiped out in a really short time. So the last sighting of the dodo was in 1662. So today the dodo is used as a universal symbol of extinction because it, it tells a very sad uh, story for a species. So since my focus is mainly on reptiles, I'll just talk about the reptiles of Mauritius. Uh, so before, uh, like I said before, all the human settlers came in, there were no mammals on the island except for bats. So in the absence of mammals, uh, the reptiles in Mauritius over so many thousands of years had uh, evolved uh, to have very unique adaptations to fill various ecological roles that usually mammals fill in other places. So for example, there were no herbivorous mammals in Mauritius. So there were reptiles that were adapted to do the same functions. So some of these adaption, adaptations include uh, things like pollinators, germinators, predators, they were prey, they are scavengers, grazers, browsers, and they perform these various functions so that they can maintain the ecosystem function. So out of uh, 17 native reptile species that uh, inhabited mainland Mauritius, Today, there are only 12 left. So this picture is uh, of an ornate day gecko. Personally, this is one of my favorites because they are really beautiful. I mean, their color scheme is really something very fascinating to me. So yeah, and you see a lot of them in Mauritius, especially on the island that I was based in. So uh, just to give a background of the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation, um, so how it started was uh, Gerald Darrell. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of this uh, very famous personality. He's a British naturalist, he's a conservationist, he's an author of very good books, which I highly recommend. Uh, he's a television presenter and he's also uh, the founder of the Jersey Zoo in UK. Uh, so what's interesting uh, is that he was born in India in 1925 in a place called Jamshedpur. So he stayed there for a few years before he moved, before his family moved to Europe. And then he grew up to have this really incredible childhood and did a lot of things for conservation. And he eventually founded the Jersey Zoo. So he, after his visit to the Mascarene Islands in 1977, uh, he initiated this uh, uh, program in Mauritius uh, with the Jersey Wildlife Preservation Trust in order to collect funds and also conduct conservation work uh, for this Mauritius wildlife, which he realized was under a lot of threat when he visited the country. So if anyone's interested, there's a book called Golden Bats and Pink Pigeons, which is his account of this uh, adventure. So in the present day, uh, Mauritius Wildlife Foundation works closely with the National Parks and Conservation Service. Uh, they also work with local universities and a lot of private sector companies uh, to carry out conservation work. So a lot of the species recovery and uh, habitat restoration efforts that began in the 1970s, uh, 
with the collaboration of various global uh, institutions, uh, they still continue today. Uh, another thing is, I think uh, some of you also might have heard of cases, the very popular cases like the Mauritius Kestrel or the Pink Pigeon, which is also uh, been projects of this foundation, uh, where they have been they have bounced back from the brink of extinction. And these are used as case studies in a lot of textbooks today to, to teach conservationists on how to bring back uh, really threatened species. And uh, another interesting thing that the foundation does is that they build the capacity of many local and foreign conservationists. So for example, like that's how I had an opportunity as well to learn from how they do their conservation work. And it's good because, uh, for, I mean, hundreds of these biologists and others have gone uh, and used some of these successful techniques in Mauritius and used it in their own countries uh, to bring about a useful effort in bringing back some of their own threatened species. So um, I'll be, uh, Mauritius has many uh, smaller islands around it, but I'll be talking about two of the main ones. One of them is Round Island, which is quite special. Uh, it's a closed island nature reserve that's only about 219 hectares. Uh, so it's also listed as an important bird and biodiversity area because several uh, species of seabirds come and breed here. And uh, it's also interesting because at one time it had one last remaining tree for a critically endangered hurricane farm. So it was the last one left in the whole world. But yeah, now they have managed to propagate uh, some of the uh, plants, so which is good. And uh, in the past, uh, they also had lots of rats, goats and rabbits on this island that have been introduced by people. So, uh, so much of the, uh, the habitat was severely destroyed degraded and lots of the endemic species there were being rapidly wiped out. So this place is also famous for being uh, said that there are more threatened species per unit area here than any other area in the world. So that's why this place is quite special. So as I mentioned before, there are only 12 uh, reptile species left in Mauritius out of the original 17. And from these 12, uh, seven of these are like were restricted to these islands in the north, like Round Island and a few of those around Round Island. And six of these species, thankfully, they have now been successfully translocated to other offshore islands where there are no rats and uh, they have they have like a safety population, extra populations there for added security. Uh, what's interesting is that um, this little reptile here, it's called the Darrell's night gecko, uh, and it's found only in Round Island at the moment. So it's, it also brings to mind how, uh, you know, such a, uh, you can have sometimes like, for example, if there's a threat from a cyclone, one big cyclone, and it can wipe out a significant number of the population. And it's really, um, an issue when this is on a very small landmass like this of just 219 hectares. So it's quite serious. And when you translocate populations, uh, in addition to having the extra security uh, safety net, they also help to diversify the genetic diversity. So the second island, which I'm going to talk about today is Illos Egret, which is uh, roughly translated as Island of Egrets. Uh, but there are no more egrets there. Uh, I think this was probably in the past. And uh, this is having the last piece of dry coastal forest left in all of Mauritius. And it's just a small 27 hectare islet. It's also a nature reserve. And this is where I was based for my internship. And uh, visitors are usually not allowed unless they are, uh, they join an eco tour run by the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation. So this is one of the ways in which uh, they also uh, have an additional income to support their conservation efforts. Um, and this islet is just uh, 850 meters from the mainland. So it's very close to the mainland. Uh, it's, yeah, you can see it from there. And uh, 
So unlike the mainland, which is made of volcanic uh, rocks, uh, this little islet is made up of coralline limestone because of the seabed that rose. And uh, oh, from 1987, they have been doing a lot of restoration efforts, that is uh, removing all the introduced plants and animals that don't belong there and planting native coastal species. And that's how they have generated this uh, fairly dense forest in this little island. And they have also other projects, bird projects that run on this island. For example, they have a small population of pink pigeons. They have some Mauritius fodies and Mauritius olive white eyes, which are all endemic and threatened. Uh, so they are also having like uh, success in increasing their populations. So for the two types of reptiles that I'll be talking about today would be the Gunther's gecko and the Telfair's kink. And there's also a third reptile, which is actually an introduced population of uh, Aldebra giant tortoises. So there's an interesting story about them, which I'll also share. Uh, if you have been following the news in the last uh, three days, uh, you have probably heard of this disaster that happened in Mauritius. Uh, now the place is in a state of emergency and there's a lot of so many thousand tons of oil leaking into the sea and you can see this is actually the island that I was talking about, Ilozegret, and this is the extent of the oil spill. So it's really a shock to most of us to see this and there's a risk to the coral reefs around the area and the wetlands are not very far away in the mainland. And even the oil fumes, they might be harmful to a lot of other species in the area. So as I know that there are many volunteers and organizations working closely to try and uh, minimize the spread of this uh, oil spill. Yeah, so I think it happened when one of this Japanese uh, vessel uh, hit a coral reef while traveling from Brazil to China. So yeah, that's uh, happening right now as we speak. So for the endemic uh, reptile recovery program, these are the two focus species that I worked on. The first one is the Gunther's gecko. So it's 25 centimeters in length, which is a really chunky gecko, it's quite big. Uh, and it's also a very cryptic species that's really hard to find. So when I first joined uh, for the first few days, like I, I can look around, but I can never spot these animals because they are so well camouflaged. But with time and with some experience, I began to finally you know, spot them. So that was interesting. Uh, so for this gecko, uh, what, uh, what is done mostly is they monitor the population. Uh, because in 2010, uh, they bought 50 of these geckos from Round Island. Uh, at the time, they were found only on Round Island. So they bought 50 and put them on this island. And then uh, today there is about 230 of them. So they have been breeding successfully here. And so that's what we do. Like we have to monitor daily uh, on their population uh, and as well as the distribution in the island. And you can find them on trees such as ebony. Uh, pictured here is a plant called the Dracaena. They, they, they also seem to like this tree. They're also found on ficus trees, and this is really hard to find because they are almost the same color as the ficus. <laughs> and uh, is it is it something like a coconut tree? Uh, no, it's not like a coconut tree. It's a, uh, a bit like an ornamental plant. Oh, yeah. okay, okay, okay. Yeah, and it has like uh, long leaves like the pandan plant. <laughs> yeah, so... Then they are also found on some old uh, wartime building structures because they used this island like uh, lots of in during the World War as a base. So there are some leftover cannons and things like that. So they also seem to like uh, being on these buildings. And during the uh, breeding season, uh, we have to monitor like where they lay the eggs, how many eggs did they lay and how much of them hatched. Uh, so just to see how well they're doing on the island. Uh, that picture is an example of them laying eggs uh, in a building. So their eggs are much like, you know, the Mentos candy. It looks just like that. You, you can't tell them apart if you put them together. So it looks like that. And uh, the second uh, 
reptile here is uh, the Telfair skink. And that's also a big skink, about 31 centimeters in length. They're a little aggressive, especially uh, during the breeding season. They can get quite aggressive fighting for females. So the one in this picture has a bit of blood near the eyes because he was in a fight with another male. So what uh, they do for this particular skink is that uh, it's in a head starting program. Uh, when the little ones hatch, usually the females uh, bury their eggs. And when they hatch, we catch them. And then we put them in a captive container, a, a large container. And uh, they are usually, we, we feed them uh, things like insects, crickets, uh, sometimes cockroaches even, and uh, until they grow to a larger size. So the idea is that when they are larger, they can't be predated on by some of the predators on the island. So they have a better chance of survival in the wild as a bigger, uh, a longer, in, when they're bigger in size. So that's what we do with them. Uh, yeah. And that is just a picture of this container that, you know, we keep them and we try to make it look as natural as possible to the wild where they are usually there. And they are also fed apple sometimes and fig from the island, uh, sorry, ebony fruit from the island. So uh, in order to have a supply of uh, crickets, uh, also there's a separate area where you have to feed the crickets and maintain those colonies so that there's enough food supply for these uh, reptiles. Okay, the third one is, uh, this is uh, a giant tortoise which has been introduced from seashells. Uh, so what happened was in the past, Mauritius had two species of giant tortoises both of which went extinct because at the time uh, they used them as meat in ships and a lot of them were killed for food. So somehow they managed to wipe out all the uh, endemic tortoises, giant tortoises in Mauritius. Uh, what happens is because they are specialized as uh, grazers and browsers and they do seed dispersal. These are usually roles that herbivorous mammals do, but on this side of the world, they are specialized in that. So we also find that uh, like if you find them eating ebony fruit, the seeds when they uh, when they have uh, like send out their feces with the seeds, these seeds have a much better chance of uh, germination. So it's really helpful in restoring the native uh, plants there. And uh, they have used this technique both in Ilo Cigarette and Round Island. And to help these species, there are some artificial egg-laying sites on the island because it's a coralline island. There's a very thin layer of soil, so they can't really burrow to lay their eggs. So that helps them, uh, these sites. And they also have to be given fresh water on a daily basis because there are no fresh water sources on the island. Right, so the next important thing is uh, invasive species and biosecurity. So there are several invasive species on this island. Uh, the top three are the ones in red. Uh, there's a tenrec, which is pictured in on the top right. It's like a small hedgehog, but uh, yeah, it's very it's an endemic to Madagascar. And there's also the Asian musk shrew and the Indian wolf snake, uh, which have both been introduced. And then these uh, are quite uh, harmful to the populations of uh, the skink and this uh, gecko. So. Uh, there are also other things like the oriental garden lizard, uh, which is also slowly increasing its population, and house geckos, which compete with other smaller geckos on the island. And there are lots of other invasive birds as well, which are actively controlled in other bird projects because they affect things like the endemic uh, pink pigeon. And, and Dhanushree, uh, how long yeah. all these uh, species were uh, introduced, like you say, Indian wolf snake? And uh, any particular reason why they were introduced in these islands? Uh, yes, there's no reason, but it seems like they accidentally hitchhiked uh, from, you know, with all the things that they brought from other countries. Yes, so when the people came, yeah, they are mostly accidental introductions. But this uh, tenrec, uh, I know the locals eat it for meat. So I don't know, maybe some of them, maybe they introduced it. So, you know, they can have a supply. Yeah, we are not sure how, but 
they are also doing well on the island oh okay okay yeah so uh, for biosecurity is also a big problem uh, they try to keep the place free of rats and it, because it's only like 800 meters away from the mainland uh, there's like a really good chance you know if a rat came in by a boat or something it could be a real disaster because rats spread very quickly so there are uh, biosecurity protocols that have to be followed for example there's something called a chew cube which uh, is a picture on the bottom right it's actually candle wax mixed with chocolate so we have put this around the island there are specific locations and we have to monitor these to see what the bite mark is so rats have a very distinct bite mark that can be used uh, as a a guide if there is a rat they also use suited tires which are white tires with uh, when you burn it with a candle there's like a black layer so if something runs over this you can tell by the footprint what kind of animals are there so they try to increase the ways in which you can detect uh, for the presence of rats and predators are controlled actively by various types of trapping for example the top picture it's in a green bin that's called a pitfall trap so that is used to control them and yeah unfortunately they have to be euthanized because if not there is no other way to control them so that's also being done on the island and uh, because like it's such a a very serious situation and if you allow them to grow in their populations they will easily wipe out many of the endemics and then it will also undo many years of conservation efforts that have been done uh, all these years so for example the biosecurity in round island is even more strict like if you're going there you have to check all your clothes to see if there are any accidental grass seeds thing food is checked like you know by centimeter by centimeter everything is checked washed cleaned like sealed and then when it goes on round island also they will open it up in a quarantine room and check if anything accidentally has come because they don't want anything for in going there and we are also like we have to stop eating things with seeds like chili or tomatoes because you don't want an a plant growing there by by accident it's much like new zealand very strict about security protocols so uh, some of the challenges so i i spoke about many of them so i will just run through uh, some of the like this in a summary so to have success in this uh, uh, projects they have to have a long term commitment like you can't have a project that runs for two or three years and you know when the funding stops uh, things uh, go to a halt and sometimes it goes back to its uh, natural state which which is uh, not ideal so in case of mauritius they have been working for more than 3 years and like that's why they have been able to bring back things like the pink pigeon there were only 9 left in the wild in 1990 and from that 9 they managed to bring it up to now 470 which is a good number so mauritius is an extreme case really because you know they are a really small island and their biodiversity is much more threatened than like larger land masses in other parts of the world but uh, if you look at the trends these days it seems like many countries are headed towards some kind the same fate because you know they, if they don't change the way they are doing things and uh, for example even that oil spill that was something that was so sudden and now they have to really work to mitigate that problem Uh, and then translocated populations are good for extra security because you know something a major catastrophic event like a cyclone can wipe out an entire species so if you have a buffer population somewhere else you can always you know work with that and you have to always monitor the species you have to see if their populations are going down what are their threats and try to adapt uh, various techniques so that you can help the species and uh when you help uh, these species you have to also make sure that they have a better survival success in the wild so for example like the tail fast kings i said you have to hand rear them and may help them grow a bit larger and then release them so there's a better survival rate and in the case of birds like the pink pigeon they have to give supplemental feeding they can't just release them and if there's no food in the wild they are going to die again so they have to be given supplemental feeding until Uh, it, the habitat is able to support them and there are also captive breeding techniques which we didn't use on the reptiles but 
they had used it on the pink pigeon and the Mauritius kestrel. So this is also a very interesting if anyone is interested in birds, you can, you can read up about that. Uh, how they take the eggs and you know how they help to help the birds to lay more eggs and watch the chicks and yeah it's a lot of work and then biosecurity and predator control is also very important because uh, it can really uh, undo many years of conservation efforts or wipe out species and sometimes you have to use innovative methods like the introducing a foreign giant tortoise to replace uh, the two extinct tortoises so that you know the functions in the ecosystem can carry on and then there's also um, habitat restoration which is very important you can't have species recovery without habitat restoration so they have to really go hand in hand one can't exist without the other so the other thing is um, if you're working with a really threatened species you have to make sure that you address the original threats where that actually drove this species to uh, to become endangered. So if you don't uh, address the original threats and then you try to conserve them, it's really difficult because that is still there, the pressure is still there. So things like poaching uh, or deforestation or even community subsistence, you have to find ways to work with the community and uh, also to help them give alternative livelihoods so that they depend less on the forests and all and putting pressure on those habitats for these species. I'm sure most of you are following this in, in some of the projects that are carried out in India as well. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of bad news uh, in the conservation world. We hear so much of things happening which make us sometimes negative, but it's also important that, you know, those small victories have to be appreciated. So, for example, the winds here, in this case, they, they managed to downlist the pink pigeon from critically endangered to endangered and then to vulnerable in 2018, which is good. So it's really reversing uh, this uh, this arrow is the direction we have to go. And the Gunther's gecko is the other one where it was also downlisted from endangered to vulnerable in 2018, which is really good news. Uh, so that brings me to the end of uh, my presentation about the internship itself. But I have just one more slide to, for any aspiring uh, conservationists who might be there, who might be interested. So just wanted to say that, I mean, there are many paths within nature conservation. It's not just for the biologists. We need educators, even accountants, you know, engineers, tour guides, a lot of people to help uh, in, in the bigger picture. So... It's also very important to network, you know, because sometimes it's about who you know. <laughs> so it helps to more know what are the opportunities. So it's, that helps a lot. That helps yes. really a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's something important. And you must also keep up to date with the information. Like things are changing so fast and, you know, we have to keep up. So read and read. And it's also good to volunteer with uh, interest groups in your areas. I'm sure something interests you or you're good at something, just join them. It's nice. You can meet friends uh, with similar ideas. So that's good. And I mean, I'm sure you all also like that. You seem to have a nice uh, tight community here, which is really nice. And since this is the uh, ladies league, I have to mention women in science <laughs> uh, because yeah, we had to try to you know, have better representation in terms of gender. Like I know like reptiles are already very unpopular in most parts of the world. And to find female herpetologists is there. But even in other science occupations, like we are told that from a young age, you know, this is not a job for you. You know, there are certain barriers and uh, cultural things that maybe needs to slowly change. So we have to encourage even the men, if you have daughters or sisters, yeah, please encourage them to join the uh, bandwagon because we need more people for the course. And then uh, everyone has some talent. So it's nice if you can marry your talent, you know, to give a voice to the environment. So I was talking with Sharmista the other day about uh, Rohan Chakrabarti, like I'm a big fan of green humor. So <laughs> he's using his talent in art to like really make a difference in terms of awareness, interest, and bring about these serious conservation issues. So yeah, I hope he's listening. <laughs> if not, I'll send him the re recording. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. So yeah, everyone has a talent. You can try to use it in a good way. 
and then maybe some of you want to make a career switch to conservation which is a little more challenging so that takes some advanced planning you know you have to prepare mentally there will be setbacks you have to plan finances get the right qualifications the experience you need good mentors as well and gain soft skills uh, things like public speaking which you need to use a lot and people skills uh and then yeah so ultimately yeah, i mean the health of the planet will depend on you know all the people who are very environmentally conscious so yeah i think that's the direction we have to try to go and inspire others to join us yeah so that's the end of my presentation uh, if you all have any questions i will be happy to answer them yeah uh yes yes and um, thank you thank you dhanushree for a wonderful session i mean as i said you know like this is the first session you are having on reptiles and uh, that to reptiles <laughs> of mauritius okay so my question for you first and foremost what what uh, you know like uh, what was the inspiration for you to become a bi uh, no, like wildlife biologist okay so i grew up in sri lanka um, in a place called kandy so we have a lot of wildlife around the area so it was very normal to see animals around the house so i used to like rescuing them and uh, learning about them so yeah that that was like a childhood interest that i kind of kept to myself and you know i did jobs in other fields and you know i realized that's not something i'm to happy to do and then yeah that's how i made this switch okay so the, your yes. entire educational journey was in sri lanka right uh, no uh, part of it uh, yeah until my a levels and then for my uh, tertiary education i went to singapore for my oh, yeah. graduate studies yes okay 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 yeah. so how has been your uh, family's perception of a daughter getting into wildlife and that too now you know like reptiles <laughs> <laughs> yeah they are actually very supportive uh, because they see that i'm really interested in the subject and uh, i was allowed to you know walk around in the garden and do things when i was a kid so they did help me encourage me in some ways and uh, i think now they are less afraid of reptiles now compared to how they were especially things like snakes and Uh, even they are more welcoming like they try to instead of killing a snake they try to catch it and relocate it which is nice so things like that yeah <laughs> uh, that the perception uh, need to be changed you know, it, it's very difficult i mean uh, what is your suggestion how you can make people reptile friendly i mean that's a very generic question but you know like uh, keep uh, yeah wondering I about it Yes, uh, with reptiles it's very challenging because we know even in India you all have like venomous snakes and people there are cases where people die as well. Uh, but I think um, for reptiles uh, a lot of it is misconceptions about them which need to be cleared through education and awareness. Like if you you know that not all the snakes out there are venomous. So if you just learn which ones are venomous for example in sri lanka there are about six main snakes you need to know can be fatal if bitten so if you know this you know that the others are not venomous and you don't really have to kill them unnecessarily so i think it really helps with the awareness and and there are also interest groups for reptiles now where they try to help each other someone sees a snake here and they like can you help me catch it then they'll go and help you know there are volunteers so to help relocate and things like that so i think slowly things are changing for reptiles <laughs> but surely and uh, one more interesting thing because you have i saw it in your presentation you were mentioning about poaching so yes. uh, uh, poaching uh, is, is, is is does it happen in mauritius also uh, poaching not so much but maybe in the past uh, before they were nature reserves now it's very regulated they can't uh, go into the two islands that i mentioned but um, there are other little islands that that are not protected so anyone can visit these islands and the poaching can happen yeah but it's not the biggest threat there okay 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 yeah. and uh, uh, you were mentioning about the zico tours uh, to round island right uh, no to illo segret the yes. other one okay yes. okay okay so uh, if someone wants to uh, uh, you know like uh, uh, do the seco to so we have to call i mean contact uh, the mauritian wildlife foundation uh, right yes so at the at the beach uh, there is a little uh, post there's a, where they have this office mm -hmm. and you can even go there or call them in advance to uh, organize a tour so they run several tours in the day 
and mm -hmm. yeah and then there's a guided tour around the island sometimes there are vip tours as well where they get like a closer interaction with some of the animals so mm -hmm. yeah it's it's a really good uh, interesting experience and okay, also so the, helps in conservation yeah, yeah. so the, so the uh, people are not uh, allowed to stay on the island right Yes, so there are just some biologists who are allowed to stay permanently, but mm -hmm. uh, nobody else is allowed to stay there unless they are escorted by the Wildlife Foundation. Yeah. Okay, 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 okay. And uh, yeah, uh, Sharmishta, anyone else has got any questions? Please go ahead and you can ask, unmute yourself and ask. Uh, Dhanushi, it was wonderful and uh, very nice to see you. Um, I am remembering my days uh, in Singapore. Uh, Zoom. Really? <laughs> Our <laughs> volunteer work together and we used to see so many uh, lizards uh, which were like uh, getting transported through illegal trade and they were being captured. Yes. And, uh, we saw those. I don't have the photos right now. Yes. So my question uh, today is uh, you are uh, you are saying that now it is well monitored at least these two islands are well monitored now yes so are you using any technology or it is totally uh, man uh, <clears throat> um, managed uh, and uh, uh, there will be some micromanagement also for these uh, reptiles uh, yes, so for the moment they are just monitoring, uh, it's monitored by the biologists, so they don't use uh, any other uh, things as far as I know, yeah. Okay. And it's also it's just a visual, uh, uh, you mean just a visual observation. Anyway, it's, it's, it's all about, I mean, it's not big mammals, there's no mammals. I think yes. it's the only way one can, uh, right? Yes. And then they have like research, they have uh, various surveys that they do regularly. So we have to record all the data and then they will be analyzed later. So you are also doing the uh, population count of these uh, reptiles? Yes, yes. So that one also uh, like uh, how many people uh, are part of the team? It is like uh, local people are also included in that? Uh, yes, there are some local conservationists, but uh, when I was there, uh, there were about two or three on the team for the reptiles. Okay. Yeah. Since it's a really small island, like you can you can cover it with a few stuff. Okay. Yeah. And uh, for volunteering, uh, like uh, what is a, a, a process, you know, like, uh, I mean, uh, today- if Somebody uh, wants to do volunteer work. Yes. How to uh, join this? Yes, so uh, you can actually go to their website and from time to time they will uh, advertise positions uh, for these uh, internships. So that's the best way to apply and uh, try to get through, yeah. So do they, do they I mean, the, does the volunteers require any uh, specific uh, qualification, educational uh, qualification? Um, yes, I think they have some minimal requirements, uh, probably like a degree and also some experience in handling whatever type of species that uh, you're interested in. It, it really helps if you have some experience. Okay. And how far these uh, from the mainland, uh, these two islands? Uh, so, uh, Ilo Zegrit is only like 850 meters, which is not much. But uh, Round Island is like 22.5 kilometers, so it's like a long boat ride away. Where only the Coast Guard can take you, it's because it's like high security there. All right. Yes. So when you were doing your um, uh, work there, so uh, you were the only one, or uh, I mean, uh, uh, were there other biologists also? Yes, no, there were quite a, a few a number of biologists. I think at any time there's sometimes ten or you know. 12, it depends oh, okay. on how yeah, because there are lots of parallel projects running on the island for the birds, uh, for the reptiles, so there's, and also there's plant restoration work going, so there are lots of uh, biologists and other people working there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes, uh, Sharmishta. You can yeah, so uh, I have one more question, like uh, you said that you are now part of this policy management of wildlife. Uh, yes, I'm just uh, with the team uh, in Singapore. Yeah, it's because I'm part of a research team with the Wildlife Management Division. Okay. Uh, so I mean, they do make they do eventually take decisions. I don't make them, but you know, I can I contribute towards the uh, 
research that goes into making some of the decisions here with regards to certain types of wildlife and my project is on pest birds oh okay yeah so pest birds means uh, 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 sri lanka uh, in uh, singapore yes yes things like pigeons and minas which have become a problem lately <laughs> okay. yeah um we have uh, we have a young uh, researcher abhinesh would you like to ask some questions abhinesh is it there or not i've left my contact details as well in case yes. anyone wants to email me or so i'll be happy to answer anything anybody wants to ask any question you can put it on chat or you can directly ask uh, dhanushree yeah let me just check if on facebook anybody has uh, okay. any questions are there any reptile uh, sorry amphibians over there but anyway it is island so yes amphibians won't be much right won't be but on the main uh, island of mauritius the mainland they have some uh, frogs and all that but not on this one okay yeah they are also likely maybe some of them are introduced like the yeah house toad danush have you been to india no not yet but i would really like to visit india someday <laughs> do please visit to please visit and uh, it will yeah. be really Let nice let me know when you me. want to visit yes thank you sir mr that will be really nice <laughs> you all have such amazing biodiversity and yeah there's so much to see and learn <laughs> yes uh, sharmishta there is no more questions on the facebook okay, okay fine fine so uh, i think uh, we can wrap up the session today uh again many many thanks dhanushree uh, for your time and uh, presenting your experience and sharing her experience thank you so much gitanjali so on behalf of uh, all ladies league and uh, it nature trust we thank you and end our session then bye looking for more sessions dhanushree <laughs> thank, yeah, thank you thank you thank you thank you probably we'll come with you to mauritius thank oh, you yes. <laughs> i am coming <laughs> <laughs> yeah and all the all the best to you all as you. well in the work that you do yes thank you right thank, thank, thank you thank you thank you everyone thank, thank you, you. So bye bye bye